30. The Antithesis A basic aspect of Christian faith is its assertion that there is an antithesis or division in the world that man must recognise and reckon with. Historically, Calvinistic circles have been those which have developed the doctrine of the antithesis and they have located it in mankind. The term antithesis is a new term for an old doctrine. Scripture makes a distinction at the very beginning of the antithesis between the sons of Seth, the people or sons of God, and the line of Cain, the reprobate race of men, the sons of men, Genesis 6-2. Covenant keepers and covenant breakers are seen throughout Scripture as two humanities with differing destinies. St. Augustine set forth this contrast in the city of God as between two kingdoms, the city of God versus the city of man. The term antithesis came into use in the last century as a reaction to the influence of Hegel. In Hegelian philosophy, the dialectical process characterizes reality. All being was originally one primordial being, which as it developed or evolved, moved from its first stage, thesis, to a second stage, antithesis and thesis, wherein seeming contradiction exists. The antithesis seems to deny the thesis, but antithesis as the second phase of the dialectical process, while apparently very different from and in contradiction to the first stage, thesis, is in fact, like the thesis, an evolving and partial truth. The third stage is the synthesis, wherein the partial truths of the thesis and antithesis are blended to form a new level of being which transcends both thesis and antithesis. The roots of this Hegelian doctrine are very old. They were well developed when Joachim of Flora developed his theory of the three ages of history, the age of the Father, or Law, the age of the Son, or Grace, and the age of the Spirit, when all peoples and faiths will find unity on a new level. Third age or third world thinking is still very much with us. With the Enlightenment and such thinkers as Drago and Comte later, the third era came to mean the age of science. The Hegelians from Max Stirner, Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche on held emphatically that God was now dead and man must live beyond good and evil. Against this anti-Christian faith and synthesis, Calvinists in the Netherlands began to assert the doctrine of antithesis or division. Because the doctrine of the antithesis so clearly sets forth a basic aspect of Scripture, neo-Orthodoxy has felt it necessary to pay some kind of lip service to the doctrine while effectively negating it. Henry Van Til gave a good summary of these efforts. Quote, According to existentialism, the antithesis is vertical, that is, between God and man, as creature. Man as creature is placed under the judgment of God. This is also the position of Karl Barth and Paul Tillich, but Calvinists reject this construction which denies the revelation of Scripture. For the Bible tells us that God made this world good with all that is in it, that he took delight in his creatures, man included, The judgment of God, according to Scripture, is against man as sinner, for his wrath is revealed against all unrighteousness, and his punishment fell upon the human race on account of sin. Genesis 3, Romans 1, 18, 2, 2, 5, 12, etc. But for Barth and the existentialists in general, eternity stands in judgment against time, and God declares an absolute no against all history. God is her judgment, her crisis. Calvinism also rejects the idea of an internal dualism, namely between God and Satan, spirit and matter, being and non-being, or between two principles, one good, the other evil. This tension in eternity is usually carried over into the created world as one existing between creation, which is good, and das Nichtige, or the principle of evil. Even though some thinkers deny a dualism and intend to keep an ultimate principle of good or God as predominant, in effect the antithesis is no longer a biblically oriented idea 
that becomes a philosophical construction, as in the case of Paul Tillich. End quote. Henry Van Til's point is a very important one. To place the antithesis in eternity is to absolutize evil, Satan, or whatever else is involved in the antithesis, and to place it on an equality with God. The result is dualism. Thus, if we assert an antithesis between God and evil which is metaphysical and originates in eternity, we have elevated evil to an eternal principle which is on equality with God. Evil, however, is ethical or moral, not metaphysical. The whole of God's creation, both in time and in eternity, the creation of angelic beings, is wholly good. Evil is the revolt of the creature against the Creator and is the creature's attempt to be his own God and to define good and evil in relation to himself. Genesis 3.5 The righteousness of God, of which his law is the expression, is an aspect of his absolute and eternal being, but the moral response of the creature, whether good or evil, is on an entirely different and historical level. Thus, the antithesis must be biblically oriented, first of all, that is, as it is set forth in biblical history, and it is not primarily philosophical because it is an ethical, not a metaphysical fact. A metaphysical antithesis leads to dualism, to Zoroastrianism and Manichaeanism. A metaphysical antithesis, however, destroys the moral antithesis. If the universe is made up of two equal and opposing principles and beings, light and darkness, a good God and an evil God, love and hate, yang and yin, or any other version of the metaphysical antithesis, the result is that there is an equality not only between the two forms of being, but also between their moral attributes. Evil is then equal to God. The medieval and other Manichaeans thus did not hesitate to perform any of the actions they condemned because all actions were a matter of choice and were all equal. Their preferred way might be no sexuality at all, but incest, adultery and marital relations were all equally bad and equally good because all sex and non-sex had an equal metaphysical and moral ultimacy. Ascetics of India and ancient China could, in terms of the same equal ultimacy concept, deny sex or choose it as their way of life. When God created man, he immediately told man of the antithesis between obedience, the good, and disobedience, evil. Quote, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17 Man was thus presented with a moral choice and also an epistemological choice, that is, a choice as to how he would seek to know reality in terms of obedience to God or in terms of his own claim to an autonomous knowledge, a knowledge particularly in independence from God. Dr. Cornelius Van Til has given eloquent and telling expression to the meaning of this. Quote, we know that sin is an attempt on the part of man to cut himself loose from God, but this breaking loose from God could, in the nature of the case, not be metaphysical. If it were, man himself would be destroyed and God's purpose with man would be frustrated. Sin is therefore a breaking loose from God ethically and not metaphysically. Sin is the creature's enmity and rebellion against God, but is not an escape from creaturehood. When we say that sin is ethical, we do not mean, however, that sin involved only the will of man and not also his intellect. Sin involved every aspect of man's personality. All of man's reactions in every relation in which God has set him were ethical and not merely intellectual. The intellect itself is ethical. What then was the result as far as the question of knowledge is concerned of man's rebellion against God? The result was that man tried to interpret everything with which he came into contact without reference to God. 
The assumption of all his future interpretation was the self-sufficiency of intracosmical relationships. This does not signify that man would immediately and openly deny that there is a God, nor does it mean that man would always and everywhere deny that God is, in some sense, transcendent. What he would always deny, by implication at least, would be that God is self-sufficient or self-complete. At best, he would allow that God is a co-relative to man. He might say that we need God to interpret man, but he would at the same time say that in the same sense we need man to interpret God. He might say that the temporal cannot be interpreted without reference to the eternal, but he would at the same time say that the eternal cannot be interpreted without reference to the temporal. He might say that we need God in order to obtain unity in our experience, but he would at the same time say that God needs the historical many in order to get diversity into his experience. All these forms of correlativity amount in the end to the same thing as saying that the finite categories are self-sufficient. For that reason, we can make a very simple and all-comprehensive antithesis between the knowledge concept of all non-Christian philosophies and the Christian view. Scripture says that some men worship and serve the Creator, they are the Christians. All other men worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator. Christian theism says that there are two levels of thoughts, the absolutes and the derivative. Christian theism says that there are two levels of interpreters, God who interprets absolutely and man who must be the reinterpreter of God's interpretation. Christian theism says that human thought is therefore analogical of God's thought. In opposition to all this, non-Christian thought holds in effect that the distinction between absolute and derivative thought must be wiped out. Thus, the Christian concept of analogical thought and the non-Christian concept of univocal thought stand over against one another as diametrical opposites. Non-Christian thought holds to the ultimacy of the created universe. It holds, therefore, to the ultimacy of the mind of man itself and must in consequence deny the necessity of analogical thought. It holds to the normalcy of the human mind as well as to its ultimacy. It holds to the normalcy of the human mind as it holds to the normalcy of everything else in the world. End quote. The antithesis is thus epistemological as well as moral. Men know things differently in terms of other religious and moral commitment. In principle, quote, the natural man has epistemologically nothing in common with the Christian, end quote. Only after the consummation of history does this principle become fully a reality when the natural man is left wholly to himself and to his principle, end quote. It is the purpose of Satan to deny and to destroy this antithesis. In fact, he denies that it exists. It is his contention that God is concealing the truth concerning reality in order to compel man to continue in an unwarranted submission to God. All men are on a par with God as themselves potential gods, and all are able to determine for themselves what constitutes good and evil. Genesis 3.5 Man must thus rise above the antithesis and come to a synthesis. Man must recognise that the next stage of being and knowledge, as well as the next stage of ethics, is to live beyond good and evil, to recognise that good and evil are relative to man and cannot be used to divide men. The Tower of Babel was thus man's first great act of synthesis. The structure of the Tower suggested a ladder, steps reaching to heaven, degrees in the ascent of being and knowledge whereby man transcended the limitations of his past and made synthesis between God and man. Genesis 11, 1-4 The philosophy of the Tower of Babel is perpetuated in arrested form by Freemasonry with its degrees and by every philosophy which denies the biblical antithesis. The goal of covenant breakers has always been to deny the antithesis and to overcome their sense of guilt at their disobedience. 
Thus, many attempts are made at eliminating the antithesis or division. Men speak of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, or of the family of man, of the oneness of all men as men, and so on. If men could be left to themselves, they would soon forget the antithesis, and they would soon lose even the memory of God's requirement of obedience and of their disobedience. Man cannot forget or overcome the antithesis, because, first of all, they are God's creatures, and the requirement of his law and their rebellion against him resound through every fibre of their being. Men can forget their names, become irrational and foolish, but they cannot erase the facts that every atom of their being is a God-created fact and witnesses to its maker. Second, God's judgment compels recognition of the antithesis. According to Genesis 3, 14 and 15, quote, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. End quote. This judgment is both upon the creature who allowed himself to be used, and upon Satan, also a creature who used him. Moreover, the enmity is an age-long one. After the serpent and Eve are gone, it will persist, and it is supremely an enmity between Christ, the seed of the woman, and Satan. This is of paramount importance. The goal of Satan is to obscure and destroy the antithesis, to deny any line of division between covenant keeper and covenant breaker, between obedience to God and man's willful insistence on his own autonomous way. This false peace or synthesis is impossible, however much men may seek it. In spite of themselves, enmity is written into their lives. Satan and all godless men would like to have a peace with God and man, to go their own way and to practice their own moral premises without hindrance, but they cannot. Because they are God's creatures, their attempt places them at war with God and with themselves. Because of God's judgment, the covenant breakers cannot live in peace with covenant keepers. They war against them. Sin is cursed. It is both by its moral warfare against God and by God's judgment incapable of ever attaining its goal. These first two reasons make it clear why the ungodly cannot overcome the antithesis. A third factor is the calling of the godly. As Henry Van Til noted, quote, The doctrine of the antithesis maintains that all who are in Christ, the second Adam, are alive unto God and are therefore called to the spiritual warfare of which the Bible speaks. Ephesians 6, 10 following, Romans 7, 15 to 25, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 30, 2, 6 to 16, 16, 22, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6, 6, 14 to 18, 10, 3 to 6. Christ is the covenant keeper, the restorer of the law. He is the root of the restored humanity, for through him man is restored to God's fellowship and service, which is life. On the other hand, that part of fallen humanity which was not restored through Christ continues its existence in apostasy from the living God. As a consequence, there is in this world a great opposition between the life lived in apostasy and a life lived in obedience to the covenant, a life which through Christ was restored to the fellowship of God. And since this antithesis roots in the heart, it does not merely affect the periphery, but the whole of a man's life under the sun. Not a single aspect of life, even the seemingly most neutral, lies outside this antithesis of godliness versus godlessness. End quote. A fourth factor which prevents any destruction of the antithesis is precisely the fact that both the godly and the godless will, if true to their faith, work for conquest. The very unity of the human race in Adam leads men to seek a unified order. But the godly seek the kingdom of God, and the godless the kingdom of man. 
The clash between the two is inescapable. The doctrine of creation gives men a common origin and a common framework of purpose. In the regenerates, this means dominion over the earth under God. In the unregenerate, this means dominion over all things in defiance of God. Conquest is thus a common goal, but with very differing programs to radically different kinds of kingdoms. While the antithesis represents a division in mankind, it is not in man as such, or in his fact of humanity. Here again, Henry Van Til has glorified the matter. Quote, of course, no one contending for the comprehensiveness and pervasiveness of the antithesis, absolute antithesis, would be so foolish as to say that believers and unbelievers now have nothing in common. It has already been observed that they have a common human nature. They are image bearers of God and fell into sin in common, and they have the external preaching of the gospel in common, and the whole of the physical world in time and space, and the cultural mandate and urge, the terrain in which to work, and the tools also in common. In short, the whole metaphysical situation is common, but the antithesis is a matter of faith and the knowledge of faith. Antithesis is not in the object, but in the subject of knowledge and faith. It is a question of allegiance. Here it is impossible to temporize. One is either for or against the Christ. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. To deny the absoluteness or pervasiveness of the antithesis is to deny the absoluteness of the work of regeneration, which is an act of God through his Spirit. Absolute does not imply perfection, for the regenerate is still following after sanctification, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. But sin now dwells in the saint against his will. Neither is the unregenerate sinner perfect in wickedness. He is not absolutely, but totally depraved. End quote. To be redeemed means to move from one side of the antithesis to the other, from one plan of conquest to the other, and from one kind of knowledge to a radically different kind. When our Lord declared, quote, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Matthew 10, 34. He was setting forth the antithesis and its necessary warfare. When he declared to his disciples, quote, Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Mark 9, 50. He was setting forth their preserving and conquering power in the world and their peace as his people and kingdom.